Thomas Lee Dillon liked to immerse himself in an imaginary world, cruising the streets while pretending to be a soldier searching for enemy targets to shoot at. Before long, his imagination wasn't good enough, and with his rifle in hand, Thomas spent three years making that fantasy into a reality. This is Monsters. Born on July 9, 1950, Thomas Lee Dillon had an uneventful upbringing in Ohio. He followed the typical pattern that society expected of him, a degree in journalism, a steady job, and a girlfriend who became his wife and the mother of his child. Most people who knew Thomas, his wife, family, and colleagues, knew that he had a passion for hunting, which was how he chose to spend a lot of his spare time. It wasn't until years later that they found out exactly what his hunting trips entailed and what type of prey Thomas was hunting. During a three-year time period spanning from April of 1989 to April of 1992, five complete strangers were randomly shot to death in southeastern Ohio. All the victims were male, but apart from that, they had very little in common. The youngest victim was 21 years old, the oldest was 48. They were all alone at the time they were shot, but they were doing different things. Hunting, jogging, fishing, walking. The victims didn't know each other, and there was no common thread to connect them. By the time that three men had died in that manner, local investigators were at a loss. One of the victims, a deer hunter in his 30s, was initially believed to be the victim of a hunting accident. Later, local law enforcement began to suspect that he had been shot by the same killer. This meant that they had a list of three dead men and very few leads to follow. The killer was acting quickly, killing without witnesses, and none of his victims had survived long enough to describe their assailant to police. Then, a call came in about Claude Hawkins, a 48-year-old fisherman who had been shot and killed. Unlike the first three victims, Claude's body was found on federal property, allowing the FBI to take over the investigation. A task force was set up, with the FBI working together with Ohio's Department of Natural Resources and investigators from three different counties. The task force barely had time to orient themselves to the case. Only ten days after the group first met, another man was dead. A second fisherman, 44-year-old Gary Bradley. It felt like the killer was taunting the task force. A press conference was held about the case, trying to make more members of the public aware of the killer's M.O. The task force hoped that, with more public awareness, an increased flow of tips might stop the investigation from stagnating. Most of the calls that came in were useless. Either they were too vague to be helpful, or they provided information that investigators couldn't connect to the case. One tip, however, seemed valuable. The call was from a man named Richard Fry, who suggested that the task force should keep an eye on one of his friends, a local man by the name of Thomas Lee Dillon. Richard had gone to high school with Thomas, but he'd always been alarmed by his behavior. Even as a young boy, Thomas had expressed a fascination with death and serial killers, and often bragged about how many animals he'd killed. Thomas had told Richard that he spent time shooting out street signs, aiming his gun at cars, and shooting at store windows until the glass shattered. Sometimes when they were younger, Richard had come along with Thomas on these drives, where they took turns to shoot out the car windows. On a few occasions, they had gotten out of the car to set something on fire, then driven away before they got caught. Richard grew out of that phase, but Thomas seemed to double down as he got older, becoming more and more cruel to animals. He switched from shooting wild animals to aiming his gun at household pets. That behavior, as well as the fact that Thomas didn't seem to see anything wrong with what he was doing, made Richard wonder if Thomas was shooting at human targets as well. Out of all of the information that Richard gave to detectives, there were two incidents that he seemed to be most disturbed by. The first was a memory of Thomas shooting and killing a chipmunk in front of his young son, chasing the boy around the backyard while brandishing the chipmunk's corpse, and then rubbing the dead chipmunk on his terrified son's face after he fell over. The second incident was less violent, but something about it had stuck with Richard ever since. 
One day, Thomas had looked over at Richard, asking him if he had ever killed somebody, or if he ever thought about being able to commit a murder. Richard remembered the incident, saying, quote, The way he looked at me chilled my blood. I thought he had a secret to tell. It was the look on his face and in his eyes. In 1992, the task force officially placed Thomas Lee Dillon under surveillance. Almost 40 months into the investigation, it finally felt like they were getting somewhere. The more the task force looked into Thomas, the more of a suspect he became. They looked into his employment, finding out if he'd taken any vacation time over the past few years. As it turned out, all of the killings had taken place during times where Thomas was either on vacation or off duty for a few days. Thomas's behavior while under surveillance lined up with what Richard Fry had reported to police. The surveillance team watched in disbelief as Thomas bought himself several new guns, drove around town for hours shooting at road signs and animals, and even randomly fired bullets at populated streets. The most incriminating thing that Thomas did, however, was to visit a grave. The burial site of Kevin Loring, the deer hunter whose death had initially been recorded as an accident. There was no shortage of suspicious behavior, but investigators needed to witness Thomas doing something illegal so that they could place him under arrest. Despite watching Thomas all summer, the only crime they were able to connect him to was a cattle shooting. Finally, with proof of Thomas's illegal purchasing of firearms and possession of a silencer, the task force made a move and placed him under arrest for federal weapons charges. Simultaneously, they announced to the public that Thomas Lee Dillon was a prime suspect in the shootings, asking for anybody with information about Thomas purchasing or selling firearms to come forward. A search of Thomas's property hadn't revealed any evidence that could be connected to the murders, and investigators believed that Thomas may have sold the murder weapons after each killing to avoid capture. Sure enough, a gun dealer called in, reporting that he had bought a gun off of Thomas the day after one of the murders. Forensic analysis of the gun showed that it was the same rifle that had been used to shoot both Claude Hawkins and Gary Bradley, the last two victims in the serial shootings. It was Thomas's carelessness when talking to friends and acquaintances that led to his arrest, and without it he might have managed to continue his killings for years. At the scenes themselves, he was careful, almost clinical, leaving very little forensic evidence behind. Prosecutor Michael Miller described the scenes as saying, quote, some of the people who were killed obviously had the projectiles in them, some didn't. Some were badly damaged, but he left virtually nothing so far as spent casings or anything of that nature. It was just not there. Nobody ever saw anything. Nobody saw automobiles. There was very little to go on. Without the tip from Richard Fry, the investigation may have remained open indefinitely, leaving Ohio paralyzed in fear. One of the most unsettling things about the shootings was how random the murders seemed. The timing was sporadic, and the victims were selected seemingly on a whim. Whether they were fishermen, an unlucky hunter, or out on a weekend run through the rural roads, it felt as if anybody could be the next one killed. Miller said, quote, Everyone was fearful. I mean, it isn't that you can stay away from these things, because they were indiscriminate. You never knew when they were going to happen. Thomas was only willing to admit to the crimes after prosecutors offered him a deal. If he pled guilty, he would not face the death penalty. His confessions revealed that he had followed the investigation closely, close enough to know the names and ages of all of his victims. As Thomas discussed the details of his crimes, investigators were able to picture the thing they had been struggling to imagine since the first shooting, the thought process of a killer who shot down strangers like they were deer in a forest. Investigators doubted that someone like Thomas, who had killed without remorse for the purpose of his own entertainment, had never killed anybody before April of 1989. Thomas confirmed that in his own confession, saying that he shot a man for the first time more than a decade ago. His first victim, an adult man, had been sitting on the couch in his home, watching television. His back was to the window, and once Thomas realized that the window allowed him a clear shot, he couldn't resist the impulse. He told investigators that he had a voice in his head that told him, quote, Go back and get him. Go back and get him. It isn't uncommon for criminals to claim that they heard voices in their head during a confession. In some cases, it was a legitimate sign of mental illness, but in others, it was a clumsy effort to make the court believe they were insane. 
As an adult, Thomas had quickly settled into a routine for his hunts. He was able to buy the weapons and hunting gear that he needed without suspicion. Southeastern Ohio had no shortage of men his age who liked to spend their time hunting in the wilderness. Like the predators he was emulating, Thomas had a preferred hunting ground, the small byways that were peppered throughout rural Ohio. He would get into his truck and spend the weekend driving hundreds of miles at a time, constantly scanning for targets. He didn't act opportunistically and almost never decided to target the first person he saw. Eventually, he would see a lone person and decide to take them down. After he selected his target, Thomas would quickly turn his vehicle around, grab his rifle, and aim. He was particularly proud to tell police about his aim, telling them, quote, I never miss. An investigator said to Thomas, quote, Basically, you're a pretty good shot. And Thomas replied, quote, That's why we're here, isn't it? At one point during the four-hour-long confession, a detective asked Thomas if he wanted to look at the autopsy photos of his victims. Thomas showed immediate enthusiasm, saying he'd never seen the pictures in color and describing the autopsy as a dirty job. Regardless of his obvious joy at seeing the photos of his dead victims, Thomas never provided detectives a satisfying answer about why he killed. All he could say was that he killed because he wanted to and didn't feel any particular way, good or bad, about his victims. He hadn't been trying to punish them, he hadn't wanted them to suffer, but he also didn't regret murdering them. He simply stated, quote, They were just there, the wrong place at the wrong time. Thomas's defense team hired a psychologist, Jeffrey Smalden, to assess the defendant's sanity. Although a successful insanity defense would not mean that Thomas escaped all of the consequences of his actions, it would result in a lighter sentence and time spent in psychiatric care instead of behind bars, two things that the defense attorneys were aiming for. In Thomas's sessions with Jeffrey Smalden, there was no denying that Thomas had an above-average intelligence, with his IQ estimated at 135. The average person's IQ ranges between 85 and 115. But a high IQ didn't mean that he couldn't use an insanity defense. People of high intelligence are shown to be more likely to suffer from types of mental illness that can lead to temporary or sustained insanity. Instead, the thing that proved Thomas was sane was much more simple than an IQ test. He was sane because he had known, while he was committing each crime and while he was planning his next crime, that he was committing murder. The entire time, Thomas knew that the shootings were wrong, but that didn't stop him from hunting his next victim. Prosecutor Miller described Thomas's lack of remorse by saying, quote, I think Thomas felt like he was something special, and when he was arrested, he's not a guy that used a jacket to cover his head. You know, he looked into the camera almost with a smirk on it. I mean, he was proud of himself and proud of his period of fame, and I think he would have done it again. During one psychology session, Dr. Smalden brought up Thomas's earlier claims about the voice in his head that told him to shoot, and Thomas replied with something that the psychologist had already suspected. Although the voice was obtrusive and insistent, it was his own internal monologue, not a hallucination or some variation of a split personality. Dr. Smalden remembered Thomas saying, quote, It wasn't another voice. I know it was me. It was my own voice. It was a voice in my head. Later, Dr. Smalden described the impression of Thomas that a viewer of the videotapes of his interviews with investigators would receive. He explained, quote, What you see on the videotape is someone who looks and presents in a way that seems frighteningly normal. And the reality is that most of the people who commit crimes like those that Thomas Dillon committed come across just that way. For somebody who was capable of holding a completely normal, calm conversation with a forensic psychologist, Thomas had been ruled by his dark urges to kill for almost his entire life. He confessed that, since he was a child, he had killed what he estimated to be thousands of animals, whether they were wild animals, farm animals, or household pets. He also had a love of arson, lighting hundreds of fires. These actions were something that Thomas viewed as being separate from his own reality as Thomas Lee Dillon, loyal worker and family man. Instead, his animal hunting, arson, and murders aligned with the vivid fantasy worlds that Thomas preferred to live in. He had several repetitive fantasies that he would create for himself, including being the lead singer of the Beatles, the President of the United States, or playing with the Cleveland Browns to win the Super Bowl. 
but by far his favorite fantasy world was the one where he was a soldier at war, hunting down the enemy, and this fantasy was the one that led him to kill. Despite the differences between each of these fantasies, Dr. Smaldon noticed a common thread. He described it by saying, quote, They were all linked together by the theme of power, prestige, influence, and grandiosity. Thomas was dissatisfied with his average life. In his head, he was a beloved sports star, a world-famous singer, a president with more political and social power than Thomas could even imagine. Most importantly, he was a soldier with the power to play God, choosing whether the enemy deserved to live or die. More often than not, he was able to convince himself of the latter. However, there was one killing that Thomas claimed to regret, the shooting of Jamie Paxton. Although he hadn't had second thoughts at the time, he had felt guilty when he discovered that Jamie had been 21 years old, much younger than his other victims. He told one investigator, quote, I felt bad about the kid, you know. I didn't know he was that young. I couldn't see how old he was from a distance. I thought he was 30, 35. He had his whole life ahead of him, and I blew him away, you know. I feel sorry for him. According to Thomas, that guilt led him to doing something that could have led to his capture writing the local newspaper and confessing to the killing anonymously. In the letter, Thomas began by stating, quote, I am the murderer of Jamie Paxton. He went on to describe his own feelings at the time of the murder, saying, quote, Jamie Paxton was a complete stranger to me. I never saw him before in my life, and he never said a word to me that Saturday. The motive for the murder was this, the murder itself. Paxton was killed because of an irresistible compulsion that has taken over my life. I knew when I left my house that day that someone would die by my hand. I just didn't know who or where. Technically, I meet the definition of a serial killer, three or more victims with a cooling off period in between. But I'm an average looking person with a family, job, and home just like yourself. Something in my head causes me to turn into a merciless killer with no conscience. Five minutes after I shot Paxton, I was drinking a beer and had blacked out all thoughts of what I had just done out of my mind. I thought no more of shooting Paxton than shooting a bottle at the dump. Whether or not Jamie's family were comforted by that statement, that Jamie had just been a random target for a killer who didn't care, is anyone's guess. If Thomas's description of himself as an average normal guy with a family was meant to be comforting, it came across in the opposite way describing a killer who would never be suspected and would be almost impossible to catch. For the task force assigned to the shootings, that had almost been the case. After meeting Thomas, Dr. Smaldon doubted that the letter had been written because of guilt, remorse, or a need to make it up to the family. He also doubted that Thomas had felt so much remorse for killing a 21-year-old legal adult, but saw no issue with killing victims in their 30s. In Dr. Smaldon's opinion, like so many other serial killers, Thomas had been unable to resist the urge to insert himself into the investigation. After all, he had confessed to making a habit of visiting the graves of all of his victims, not just Jamie Paxton. Dr. Smaldon also had a theory about why Thomas wasn't able to provide a reason for the murders. In the psychologist's opinion, it wasn't that he couldn't, it was that he didn't want to. He explained, quote, I think Thomas is holding back because he wants to remain a puzzle. He would ask me, have you ever met anyone as complicated as me? Can you understand this? Is this behavior as perplexing to you as it is to me? There's never been a crime like this in Ohio, has there? No motive. No contact with the victims. How could you figure that out? And then he would shrug and say, I don't know. Thomas Lee Dillon spent the rest of his life behind bars at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility after being found guilty of five counts of aggravated murder. It was enough to ensure that he would never be a free man again, but all investigators who worked on the case believed that five deaths was only the tip of the iceberg. In their minds, it was likely that Thomas had killed many more people. Like with his motive, Thomas remained tight-lipped about whether or not he had committed any other murders, only saying that if he hadn't been caught, he probably would have kept killing. But after Thomas died in 2011 without providing any more clues, he got exactly what he wanted, remaining a mystery that even the FBI and the best psychologists in the world had never quite been able to solve. The one thing that isn't a mystery, though, is whether or not he was a monster. He was. 
If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.